This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, where I interview authors about their latest works. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books. For more book recommendations, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts from a Page, and on Twitter at burn555555. I want to say thanks to Nana at Read the World Better for sharing my podcast on her social media and EMG Reviews for posting a review on Apple Podcasts. Sharing your thoughts with others about the podcast and leaving reviews really helps my show find new listeners, and I greatly appreciate it. Today, I am interviewing Jennifer Rosner about The Yellow Bird Sings. The Yellow Bird Sings comes out in paperback next week and is her debut novel called Exquisite, Heartrending, and Absolutely Beautiful and Necessary Novel by the New York Times Book Review. Her short writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Massachusetts Review, the Forward, and elsewhere. In addition to writing, Jennifer teaches philosophy. She received her BA from Columbia University and her PhD from Stanford University. She lives in Western Massachusetts with her family. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Jennifer. How are you today? I'm terrific. How are you? I'm doing really well also. I'm looking forward to talking about The Yellow Bird Sings. Thank you. Me too. Why don't we start with you just telling us a little bit about the book? So The Yellow Bird Sings is a novel about a mother and her five-year-old daughter who are hiding in a farmer's barn in Poland during World War II. And the girl, the five-year-old, her name is Shira, she's a musical prodigy. She feels music pulsing inside her. So she taps on her mother's leg and she hums, but in the barn she needs to be completely silent. And she conjures a magic bird who sings out the music she hears in her head and in, in other ways enacts a childhood she can't have. And her mother, in an effort to pass the minutes, the hours, the days, whispers stories about a little girl and her bird who avert threats and find safety except that there are very real threats just outside the barn. And as the dangers mount, the mother is forced to make an agonizing choice about whether to keep together with her daughter, finding a new hiding place, or else to find a safe place for her daughter apart. I am so curious how you came up with the subject matter for this one. It is a wonderful World War II story, but it's a little bit of a different take on it. And I'm, I was just dying to hear what set you down the path and what made you decide to write this story. Well, I'm going to take the long run here. So I actually am a trained philosopher. I was in graduate school getting a PhD in philosophy, and then I was teaching. And then our first daughter was born, and she was born deaf, which came as a very big surprise. And I had never done any creative writing of any sort, but I think to understand what we were going through and process our feelings and our decision making, I just started journaling to try to process and these little snippets of things started to amount to like a memoir. And I ended up writing a memoir about the deafness in our family, which is deafness that both my girls share, but also I found in our in our history, in my family tree, these deaf great, great aunts who lived in a little shtetl in Austria in the 1800s. I ended up writing this braided story about raising our daughters in a hearing speaking world and the life of our my great great aunts in the 1800s and eventually I was at a book talk for this memoir and I was talking about how we gave our children access to sound and we were encouraging their every vocalization and a woman in the audience came to me and actually told me about her childhood experience having to stay completely silent hiding in a shoemaker's attic during World War II and I just couldn't stop thinking about this person, a child who had to be silenced in such opposition to what our project was to get our children to talk. And also this mom, her mom, I was imagining who needed to keep her silent and what that must have been like. And that was kind of the seed from meeting that woman at a talk for a different book. It kind of threw me into a new area of research and thought. And from that, The Yellow Bird Sings came about. That is fascinating. As I was reading as a mother of three kids, they're now teenagers, I was sitting here thinking how hard it would be to sit there with a child that age for that many months trying to keep them silent. I just, I can't even imagine. Truly, I can't imagine. Well, when I presented this book, I was in touch with a publisher who said, I can't even manage our kids on a single snow day. How could this mother in a barn manage to get her daughter through this time? And it's so true. I think it takes so much ingenuity. And from interviewing hidden children, that was something that really came through was the incredible creativity and ingenuity that parents 
who were with children hiding in these tight spots brought to it. And I was amazed because there was a man I interviewed, actually now he's a chemistry professor at Cornell. He won a Nobel Prize, I think. And he hid in a school attic with his mother who found atlases and other things and and quizzed him on geography and taught him how to read in this attic. And he actually described the time hiding with his mother in this tiny little space where other children were outside playing. And it must have been overall very, very tough. He said he felt cocooned by love with his mother, which I think is such a testament to, to her, to her parenting. I love that, that he doesn't look back on it as a frightening experience, but instead as something where he was spending that time with his mother and knowing he was protected. Yeah, it's it's amazing that he was able to feel that way, given the stressors they were clearly under. Well, there's a lot of World War II fiction, and I love it all. I mean, I could just read it all day long. What I was amazed about when I was reading your book was that even though I have read many World War II stories, and I've obviously read Anne Frank, visited her home, and that's kind of my only real encounter with hidden children, I think. There's stories about how they were hidden, but not the actual hiding. So I thought you really brought that very vividly to life and just sort of that perspective of what that must have been like. Thank you. Yeah, I I did interview many hidden children, and they all had very different stories. Some were kind of kept in these tight spaces. There were others who were hiding in plain sight on farms. Some were in the woods, had to be in a hole in the ground. I mean, there were so many different circumstances of hiding. And just trying to survive that time and the day-to-day How does one in a tiny barn use a bathroom and brush their teeth? And all these little details of life that you don't really think about, (laughs) but a parent does and needs to try to get their child through intact. We have heard of stories of people who could barely walk after being hidden for so long or whose teeth are like sponge after such a long time and trying to prevent those things from happening for your child in addition to trying to be safe and not make a sound is so overwhelming. But I was just overwhelmed by the amount of bringing love to the game <laughs> and creativity and finding interesting ways to to pass the time. So one of the things in my story is that this mother tells stories. And I think that one thing I gathered from these hidden children was just the importance of creativity and also the appreciation of beauty and how much that carried people along. So even just noticing the light or the scent or whatever could could move you forward (laughs) when things feel either stagnant or hopeless. And a mother's love, I mean, you sort of feel like that's the thing that really drives the entire safety of these children. And so the fact that these mothers just have to sort of put their own lives aside to be able to take care of their children, focus on them, keeping them safe, keeping them quiet. Yeah, and sometimes giving them away, which was so heart-wrenching and awful to even contemplate, but had to happen at times in order to feel that you were doing what you had to do to keep your child alive in the war. And then the confusion of the names. The child's young enough, they don't remember their original name. They're then given a Christian name so that that will protect them. And then trying to reunite later with the documentation not being very good. That part of it would just be incredibly frightening. It was. And people tried things like stitching names into hymns or there was um, Irina Sendler who, when she took a child, uh, she worked for Jagoda, a network that transported children to safe havens, she would try to put their given name on one side of a slip of paper and then their assumed Christian name on another and bury these names in jars in gardens. And after the war, some of those jars were unearthed and people were able to track their families. But for the most part, especially for a young child, if you're five or four, and there's just no record because records are so dangerous. And and then you're left really unsure of who you are and where you came from and no way to track yourself back to your family. And while I was doing this research, I went to the Holocaust Museum in DC and there was a program. It said, remember me. There were like all these pamphlets with photographs of children's faces. And the question, do you remember me, was this literal question. Like if you remember my face, you could tell me the name I could use to search for my family. So it was a really a huge problem. And a lot of times after the war, someone would stumble into a town, they'd find that by the train station is a huge fence with like 
pieces of paper just tacked onto the fence. This is how they were trying to find each other. Very haphazard and random and and sheer luck if it worked out. I was just going to say that. It was sheer luck and just so random, whether you happened to come across the photo of someone you knew or your neighbor knew or whatever. I mean, I, I just can't even fathom it. And now over time, registries became more common. And then there were systems in place through Yad Vashem and other searching mechanisms. But really, a lot of the finding came when they were much older through internet searching and et cetera. So, so, so much time passed. And that was another thing that was very painful because by the time you find your mother, you don't know her at all. <laughs> and the reuniting process is also very complicated just seems incredibly hard to fathom. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your research. You've mentioned a few things, but I'd love to hear what you found interesting, whether you felt that you learned a lot that you couldn't use in the book, just kind of your whole process. Yeah. So after I met that one hidden child in the book talk I gave about my memoir, she introduced me to some other hidden children she knew. And then I began interviewing a large number of hidden children. And I listened to all their stories. And then I really set them all aside because I wasn't going to write any of their particular stories. I thought maybe one day they'll write their story or maybe their children will write their story or grandchild. So I set them aside and I just tried to think of a story I wanted to tell. And I made a choice about my characters, that Shira was going to be this violinist, that her mother was going to be telling these fantastical stories, etc. So I wrote a draft of the novel. And then I realized I'm here in my window seat in Western Massachusetts. I think I better go to Poland (laughs) and just kind of do some cross-checking because there's only so much on the internet search that one can do as a novelist. And I wanted to really see what it was like to be in those places. So I found a guide in Poland who was incredible. He read my novel manuscript in advance, and then we planned out this trip. And he took me first to this area of countryside where they had barns, much like the one in my story, where Jewish people had been hidden. I got to see kind of the construction of the barn, how close they were to the farmhouse, how close to the nearest neighbor, how complicated it would be to really hide a person. Because when you think about a farm, you think they have a lot of land and maybe some privacy, but actually for community reasons, their homes were quite close together. And so people really could sort of see in to other people's lives. It was very important for me to see that, that hiding a person in your barn was very, very hard. And even that the country folk were very, very curious about each other, because even when we went to visit, my my eldest daughter came with me on this trip. It was an amazing trip. At one point, our guide took us one way to show us this beautiful Orthodox church in in the area. And when we got back to our area where we were kind of doing this barn research, some townsperson said like, oh, why did you turn left rather than right out of the parking lot? Like, (laughs) So even we were being watched and I thought, wow. So the guide also took us to a convent and this convent, their Jewish, Jewish children had been hidden. I saw a partition where they were hidden. I also got to walk in and get the like whiff of this mushroom soup that was cooking and the way your feet hit the stone floor, what that sounds like. So all these sort of sensory details about life in this convent, in this particular convent. I mean, one thing I learned, the draft I had needed to be revised, of course. I had conjured a rather fancy convent of stone. This guide was like, we're in Poland and it's somewhat poor here and everything's brick and things like that. In fact, at night he sat with me and we talked about the names of our of my characters and he made suggestions. So the mother's character's name is Vrosha in my novel, but it was initially Anya. And he said, Anya is a perfectly reasonable name for your character, but it has an economic connotation that I don't think your character has. It was sort of a bit of a richer name and Rosha is a more humble name. Little tiny things like that, which I found so valuable to be on the ground in Poland and learn from native speakers details I couldn't ascertain by searching behind the name websites in in Massachusetts. So that kind of thing is what I found incredibly helpful. And also we went to an area of forest, this primeval forest where partisans camped. I got to see what it would be like for my character to be in the woods, burrowing in the woods, trying to track through without leaving a trace, etc. And there's where I also ended up doing all kinds of consultations. So I did work with a tracker to learn how you move through the woods without leaving a trace. I worked with a mushroom forager to understand what my character would find in the woods and what season. 
and obviously like Holocaust historians and nuns, et cetera. But the most important was this master class violinist I worked with because I needed to understand how my prodigy would learn, what she would practice, what she would play, in what order. And as the music goes through in this novel, I would write to him and say, would it be possible that she would know how to play this or would she learn this first, et cetera? <laughs> Things like that, which were super helpful. And my master class violinist put me in touch with a man in Tel Aviv who's a violin maker. And there's a character in my novel who's a violin maker, the grandfather. I actually went to Tel Aviv and went to this workshop because he, in addition to talking to me about violin making, he runs this program where he has rescued violins from the Holocaust and he rebuilds them and they're played around the world in these orchestras of hope. What I found so moving about it is that you're, when you play the violin, you're kind of wearing down the instrument in your own particular way, like you're pressing with your fingers and your, the weight you bring. And so that later, even years later, when someone picks up your instrument and they play it, it's like bringing your voice back in some way, bringing back this lost player. It's very, very moving. Oh, I absolutely love that. That's just wonderful. How does he find the violins that he then restores? Well, it's interesting because there have been early on in in it someone would would bring an instrument because they were so traumatized by the war that they never they felt they would never play it again so they were going to destroy it and he said no i'm going to keep it somehow he was in touch with them and then it, as he started to rebuild them and be, they started to get known better people would be coming and whatever was salvaged from times i mean sometimes someone would find something from their attic and they had heard that their grandfather had played it at a certain time or or he did get a violin that that had ashes inside from one of the camps oh. the other thing i should say about the violin is so my dad played violin every day of my life nearly every day of his life it seems <laughs> he wasn't a prodigy and he wasn't a virtuoso he was a dedicated violinist and I grew up listening. When I learned about my great, great aunts who were deaf, the single most meaningful detail I learned is that when they turned out the lights and went to sleep, they would tie a string from their wrist to their babies at night so that if their babies cried, they would feel a tug and, and wake to care for them. It was like their way of hearing their baby cry at night. It was like this string in the darkness. And I feel like it's no accident that I gave my character a string instrument and it was her way of trying to connect with her family. Her mother was a cellist and her grandfather's a, a violin maker and her father was a violinist in this story. And her violin playing is this way of calling to them and a sort of a string in the night in some sense. So all of this was kind of stirring around in me as I was writing. Well, I was planning to ask next why the violin and then why Poland. So you explained the violin, but how did you select Poland? Yeah, I mean, Poland is a place where there was so much devastation in Poland. And there was also a lot of anti-Semitism in Poland after the war as well. I mean, it was just a complicated place. And it feels like everything that happened in the Holocaust, any detail that I might want to include would have realistically been taking place in Poland or could have taken place in Poland. I also do have relatives from Poland. My my mom's mom was from Poland. So there was sort of a personal tie, but I also just felt that for the story itself, it could, it fit. But I should say that I fictionalized everything about Poland in a certain way. Like there's no name of a town, like Gracia is a made up name. You won't find it on a map. I did that on purpose. Well, for many reasons. I mean, I picked names that had meaning, but also I felt that the heart of my story was about this mother and daughter bond. And I didn't want it to be that if the tavern I made up wasn't actually 15 kilometers from the barn, <laughs> someone would go measure and and tell me because I've I've read a lot of uh, things where historical fiction readers want to go clarify the reality of the history. And whereas I wanted to be obviously very faithful to the Holocaust, I wanted the reader to be focusing on the real heart of the story and not on any specific detail about geography. Right. That they were going to listen to what you were saying and what you were writing about and not worry about which exact town or place that it would be located. Exactly. Like focus on the emotional truths of the novel. So Jennifer, we talked about Poland and the violin. Tell me about the significance of the yellow bird. So it came about for a variety of reasons, I think. I wanted 
Shira to have a comfort in the barn. She does have a shred of blanket and she has her mother, which is more than many hidden children actually had. But she's this musician. She feels this music inside her and this bird could sing the songs that she hears in her head. So I thought that would be a really good imaginary friend. (laughs) Also, I had heard of a child who in a trauma had cupped her hands as if holding an imaginary bird and and it was her comfort. And I thought that was a really interesting psychological thing that the child might take something to care for when they feel vulnerable, kind of taking a role of caretaker rather than receiver. So all those things were kind of in my mind as I was creating Shira's character and the yellow bird. And also the mom was telling stories. And I thought now when the mom tells a story about a girl and her bird, she's kind of connecting herself to Shira's imagination and they share this thing now so that as Shira goes on in life and the bird kind of morphs in her head it is this connective tissue she feels between her and her mother in the same way that the music is and I loved that you incorporated that into the story I'm not going to say more because I don't want to spoil anything but that that tie continued through to the end of the book so the yellow, was the yellow partly chosen because of the, the yellow stars that Jews had to wear, or do you just choose yellow because you like yellow? I feel like every decision was multi-determined. I think that I was influenced by the yellow stars. I was influenced by stars outside in the sky. I was influenced by yellow feeling like a friendly color. But also, I wanted this bird to be almost so realistic you weren't positive it imaginary. And I wanted, so at times I wanted the reader to wonder if a bird actually did get in the barn, maybe. (laughs) And uh, she was cupping it in her hands because that is how I think a child's imagination works. It's very real to them. So when I'm in her point of view, I want it to seem real. And yellow to me felt like a bird could be yellow. It would be special. I couldn't make it a purple bird (laughs) because you would know is completely fantastical. But a yellow bird could be sort of one way or the other. So I thought that was a good reason to choose yellow as well. I like that. And yellow is a sunny, happy color. So kind of the idea of hope and and happiness in a grim situation. And friendship too. I think when colors get analyzed, sometimes yellow is considered a color of friendship. So this bird was her comfort and friend in some way. Well, all this yellow bird discussion makes me ask about your cover, which is just beautiful. How did that all come about? Thank you. I love the cover too. My publisher presented me with two possible covers at first. This one, although initially the photograph was complete, it wasn't torn. And another one, which was very dark, but had these little stars, like little yellow stars, probably symbolizing the moving of the little yellow bird. And it was also beautiful, but quite dark. And I just fell in love with the cover that we ultimately went with. And then the designer said, I think we should tear it because there's something torn in the story and it will alert the reader that something's off. Just a brilliant idea. So it's got a black background to also symbolize that there is darkness. And then there's a tear in the photograph It just reads that there's history, that maybe even like a family connection because it's like an old photo, and then it's torn, that something went awry, etc. The tear is ingenious. Like I thought that part of it was one of the things that really does make the cover because it's a beautiful cover. But when you have that, it makes you wonder, okay, what's going to happen? And then once you read the book and you look at it and you think they just really hit it out of the ballpark. Thank you. Yeah, they are very talented over there. (laughs) They are. They do a great job with covers. Tell me what you have read recently that you really liked. I recently read Hamnet, which I loved. Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. I also just read House on Endless Waters. I don't know if you've read it by Amuna Elan. I also really loved that very much. And I also recently read How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Zhang. I think you'd say it that way. It was just terrific. I mean, beautiful writing, sentence by sentence, really beautiful. All of those books actually are so well-written, so beautiful. Another great book that I'm reading right now is The Rose Code by Kate Quinn, who I've teamed up with several times in the past, but we're having an event coming up soon. And so I'm reading her latest and it's terrific. It is terrific. I absolutely love The Rose Code. I've actually already taped my interview with her. It'll air in March. But I just thought it was phenomenal. I've always been fascinated with Bletchley Park. So anything that takes place there, I always want to read. 
With respect to Hamnet, I actually love Maggie O'Farrell's writing. I have read almost everything else she's written. And for some reason, I passed on that book early on because it just didn't sound very good to me. I don't usually read that far back. And then everybody's been talking about it. So I bought it a couple of weeks ago and it's on my list to read because not a single person that has read it has said a bad thing about it. So I need to pick it up. And I am now I'm like, oh, I should have read it a long time ago. But I'm, I just think she writes beautifully. It's a gorgeous novel. That's the thing that's interesting. You know, sometimes you'll read a summary of something and think, eh, it's it's a danger of writing a World War II <laughs> novel. It's a danger of writing a Holocaust novel because people are sometimes overwhelmed emotionally by these subjects and they want to avoid it if they can. And whereas I feel like I really wrote a story about a mother and her daughter and the unbreakable bond and the role of beauty and human survival and all these other things, sometimes someone will just read like, oh, a girl hiding in a barn with her mother in the war and think, I don't want to read that. So it's it's always really hard to know how to get past that paragraph and just start the novel <laughs> and see where it takes you emotionally and literarily, et cetera. I agree. I just feel like the longer I do the reading and the reviewing, I, I have a pretty good sense for what I'm going to like and what I'm not. And so every once in a while, I'll override that sense. And I would say only about 5% of the time, am I glad I did? Most of the time, I'm like, I already knew it. This wasn't it just going to be the book for me. It doesn't mean it wasn't the book for everybody else. There are just some stories that either don't appeal or don't interest or just aren't going to hit you right. And so that's kind of what had happened with Hamnet. But now, because I keep hearing that, I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be in the 5%. It will. It will definitely be in the 5%. Well, I really appreciate your taking the time to join me today on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Jennifer, it was wonderful to speak with you. Thank you. I had a terrific time talking to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. Jennifer's book can be purchased at Murder by the Book, where I work part-time, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks to KP Regan for the sound editing, and I hope you'll tune in next time. Science! 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 science, science. Hello, podcast fans. Want to get weird with us? Come check out the Mad Scientist Podcast. We are a weekly show that looks at the history, philosophy, and hard facts behind your biggest paranormal questions. Did the government really pay for a psychic spy program? Yes! Is it true that surgery got its start in grave robbing? Yes! Can a roller coaster really kill you? Legally, we can't say so for sure, but sometimes, yes! Woo! Join myself, Chris Cogswell, and my co-host, Marie Mayhew, as we examine the science, philosophy, and history behind the strange and unusual. All to discover what's possible and plausible versus what's, well, just made up. Check us out wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mad Scientist Podcast.